I'm John Lisman. I think I was first uh, at MBL in 1969 as a graduate student. Uh, in those days, I still worked on photoreceptors, and so uh, I worked on horseshoe crabs, and uh, uh, it was a very important place uh, to be, and I made some important discoveries here, and oddly enough, I even uh, got an award one summer for doing the best research uh, at MBL that summer, which has kind of played out a funny, in, in a funny way in my life because when I give talks at places, uh, oftentimes uh, an introducer will look to see what kind of awards you've gotten. I haven't gotten too many awards. And so oddly enough, people often mention, and he was the best young investigator at MBL in 1969 or whatever it was. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and then uh, my life at MBL continued. Um, I offered uh, to work on horseshoe crabs. Uh, I often collaborated with someone who worked here uh, named Alan Fine. Uh, and uh, I also uh, switched over from working horseshoe crabs to working on squid, uh, trying to solve uh, the mysteries of invertebrate phototransduction. Uh, I'm sad to say I had to leave that field eventually. Uh, NIH didn't want to fund invertebrate photoreceptor work. And I'm even sadder to say that the deep mystery of how uh, a rhodopsin molecule, which is excited by a single photon, generates these giant electrical events in Limulus remains unknown. It's been one of my frustrations that I would never get to the bottom of this problem, and I probably never will. I was, uh, after I did my graduate work, uh, I went into postdoc with George Wald. Uh, so uh, he was definitely uh, interested to some extent in how phototransduction worked, but those were the uh, middle 70s, and by that time he was fundamentally interested in politics. At that time when I was working with Dr. Wald, I was more interested in the kinds of problems that uh, he actually had expertise in, which was more how does the visual pigment itself work. And nobody had ever studied the visual pigment uh, of the horseshoe crab, and I managed to figure out electrophysiological ways uh, of understanding the pigment. So that was my, my main work. I had been interested in how rhodopsin gets turned off. So we know that rhodopsin gets turned on by light, but it produces a very transient effect, and so it has to get turned off. And I there were already some indications that it got turned off by phosphorylation. And in that sense, you can think of rhodopsin as a switch. And uh, and in a sense, light would turn it on and phosphorylation would turn it off. And in my experimental work, I could actually measure how good a switch it was. Every switch, especially at the molecular level, will sometimes fail. So sometimes a switch that was turned off would spontaneously turn on. And I could actually measure that. Uh, it was an incredibly infrequent event, but I could act uh, there were some nice properties of the Limulus photoreceptor that would make it possible. Okay, so why am I telling you this story? Because around that same time is when I made the transition to understand, trying to understand memory. And what's the connection? Well, the connection was that everybody was excited by the, the problem of memory, and there were two threads of investigation. One thread was the work in the Plisia that was led by Eric Kandel. Another thread was the long-term potentiation phenomenon and that was really had it been to do with the hippocampus. And one of the major discoveries that was particularly exciting at the time about long-term potentiation 
is that it was a process which occurred at individual synapses. Now, it's important to realize that the neurons, let's say, of the hippocampus have 10,000 or 100,000 synapses. And so it was fantastic how much information uh, one cell could store if it could change the strength of each of these 10,000 10, or 100,000 synapses. Now, when you look at the work that Kandel was producing, his work suggested that what changes during learning was actually the whole cell. And the kinds of evidence that he would point to were that you, know, you could change the transcription properties in the cell, you could change the translation properties in the cell, and these are cell-wide processes, and the cell would become modified in such a way that it responded more strongly to a stimulus, and that could affect learning. And he even said that learning was just another form of differentiation, cellular differentiation as we know it today and then, involves changes in the pattern of gene expression. So what was wrong with that idea? Well, what I couldn't understand was how a change in gene expression could be relevant when you had 10 to the fourth little memories all over the dendrite to control. And so it seemed pretty obvious to me that the secret of memory at a molecular level had to reside not within the nucleus, but within each spine. There had to be some sort of uh, memory device within each spine. Well, what did that imply? What that implied, pretty much, was that the memory store would be a protein. And that, in turn, raised the question, well, if proteins are unstable, how could you ever build a stable memory? If proteins come and go, well, maybe memories would come and go, but they don't come and go. We remember something that happened in our childhood 30, 40 years ago. So thinking about the problem from that perspective, I wondered, well, what kind of switch, what kind of memory switch would be able to store information in a way that would solve the problem. And this is where thinking about phosphorylation in terms of the turning off of rhodopsin kinase was actually instructive because I was familiar with the literature on phosphorylation and one of the stunning uh, kinds of biochemical processes that had been discovered about phosphorylation was that there were proteins that instead of exclusively phosphorylating substrates could phosphorylate themselves. And this is a sort of positive feedback loop uh, called autophosphorylation. And going back to sort of my physics background, I could easily see that, you know, with a positive feedback loop, a group of molecules could phosphorylate themselves and store information uh, as a group. And since the information was stored as a group, um, an individual molecule could come and go and not have loss of information. So with that core idea, I uh, put out you know, a hypothesis uh, that, that this sort of thing might be possible. And it got a lot of attention and in part it got a lot of attention because in the same year uh, Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize winner, came out with a very related idea. So many people sort of put those two papers uh, in the same category as sort of introducing the idea of how some sort of self-sustaining biochemical process could form the molecular basis of memory. What's really been important is just the availability of so many interesting people. 
So I love to talk science with people. I'm interested in a very broad range of things. Uh, and I managed to have an interesting lunch with somebody almost every day uh, to, um, you know, to, to process neuroscience. I think you know, neuroscience has gotten so complicated that it takes a village to even understand what's out there. And the best way of doing that is, you know, a combination of reading and discussion. And, uh, you know, we have a good neuroscience program at Brandeis, but it's very small. You know, the number of people, you know, in different, not many different fields are represented. So the fact that I can come to MBL and have a great, interesting conversation uh, has been really uh, important to me.